I'd now like to bring up our conference Toastmaster, past district governor, and distinguished Toastmaster, Michelle Cable. Toastmaster, I had a big long thing and he's a humble man and he said, Frank, throw that away. <laughs> so, no problem. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our honor and privilege to have our international director. Alan is the director for eight districts under his command. He is, in a sense, if you compared him to uh, President Obama, he would be one of the cabinet members. So here to run our contest today is our contest toastmaster, Mr. Alan Shaner. See these things? They put off radial frequencies. It interferes with the sound system in here. And I ask everybody, don't turn it on silent. Turn it completely off. Put a couple hundred people in here with a couple hundred cell phones. That's a lot of radio frequencies that interferes with the sound system. So please turn your cell phone completely off.
during this speech contest, there is to be no photography, there is to be no audible recording devices, there will be video recording through the permission of the contestants and through the district. That is to be the only recording done during this contest. You're not to exit the room, you're not to enter the room while a contestant is speaking. There will be one minute of silence in between each contestant. If you need to leave the room or enter the room, do that during the one minute of silence. It's okay to laugh and cry during the contest, but don't heckle and don't interrupt a contestant. Mr. Chief Judge, Madam Chief Judge, are the contestants ready? Where's our Chief Judge? Yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Our timer today. Don, are you our Chief Timer? Here they sit. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I will. Marie. Marie. Would you please explain the timing for the benefit of all audience members? Good afternoon, fellow Wilson, and I will count the The timer will be as such. Each speaker has five to seven minutes. They can speak no less than four minutes and 30 seconds. They should not go no further than seven minutes and 30 seconds. Otherwise, they will be disqualified. We will start the timing at the time when they make a gesture or make a sound towards the audience. Thank you. I will introduce each contestant by their name, title of their speech, title of their speech, and their name. I believe we're ready to have a contest. Are you ready? Yeah! Let the contest begin. Our first contestant, Valerie Lyons. Who's the master? Who's the master? Valerie Lyons. Mr. Contest Master, Toastmaster, dignitaries and guests. I'm a little bit nervous here, and I don't mind saying that. This is my 10th competent communicator speech. I'm happy about that. Everyone cannot be here. Everyone cannot stand in front of a room of their peers and deliver a speech. So I'm proud to be here. What happens to people? What happens to make it so difficult for someone to stand in front of a crowd and deliver a speech? or do many of the things that they were destined to do. It probably happened a long time ago. Take a journey with me. Imagine a little girl in third grade with two little pigtails, wearing a plaid skirt, and she's walking to the front of the classroom. She's walking very slowly because she's shy. And when she gets to the front of the classroom, she pulls the card from the card slot, and she reads. Six times six is. Six times six is. Six times six is. But she doesn't know the answer. All of her classmates are laughing at her as a tear streams down her face. When she looks at the teacher, all she sees is disappointment. So she stares at her patent leather shoes as a warm stream cascades down her leg. That was a defining moment. 
From that moment on, she had difficulty speaking in front of a group. Many of us have had moments like that. Maybe not to that extreme, but some moment in your life made it difficult for you to stand in front of a crowd and deliver a speech or do many of the things you were destined to do. But I'm here to tell you that it's time to start anew. Start over, because those times are in the past. The one defining moment in my life is when I saw a movie. See, I love martial arts movies. My students would tell you, I love martial arts movies. And one of my favorite movies is The Last Dragon. See, in The Last Dragon, there's this guy, Bruce Leroy. He's a master, according to his teacher. His teacher said, you have made it to the final level. But he didn't believe it. He felt that he needed a master. Well, there was someone, a nemesis in this movie. His name was Show Nup. And Show Nup thought that he was the master. He was walking around saying to Bruce Leroy, who's the master? Who's the master? Who's the master? Many of us have had moments like that in our lives where someone would ask you, who is the master of your life? And you couldn't step forward and say that you were. Well, I'm here to tell you that it's time to start over. Because those days, those times, those people are in your past. You can do anything you want to do. If you are a full figure queen, then you can win a beauty contest. Yes, don't let anything stand in your way because you are this, 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 and that. You're everything. If you are blind or visually impaired, and someone told you that you can't do something because you can't see, show them how you can see using a different eye. Yes, you can do anything you want to do. You can be me, a woman of her 50s, looking gorgeous and fine, and you too can step on the stage in your bikini, compete against the 25 year olds and win! <laughs> Just like I do. You can do anything, anything you want to do. If someone told you that you were ugly, thank them. Because according to the singer Ann Halen, U-G-L-Y stands for you. Got to love yourself. Yes, you can do anything you want to do. This is for my guests. If you are afraid of speaking in front of a crowd, then it's time to join Toastmasters. It's time to be the best that you can be. Don't be afraid. I was you only one year and four months ago. Look at me now. You can do anything, anything you want to do. If you are a widow or a widower, and you're saying to yourself that you can't move on because you love this person and they're gone, it's time to step forward into your new life because that person's having fun on the other side while you're sitting here crying. You said, till death do us part. Till death do us part. That means that when death occurs, you are no longer married. Step forward, you are single, ready to make it. <laughs> you can do anything. You can believe anything. It's just a matter of perspective. See, to paraphrase Eleanor Roosevelt, today is the youngest you will ever be again. <laughs> and today is also the oldest that you have ever been. Start over. Don't let anything stand in your way. Use me as your motivation for your elevation. Do whatever you want to do. You know, right now, I'm thinking about that little girl. That third grade little girl. And she's standing right next to me. And I'm saying to her, sweetheart, that day, that time, it's over. It's in the past. Let it go. You have grown up. You have made lots of accomplishments, touched many lives, and done many things. Don't let anything stand in your way anymore. But as I walk away, she's tugging on my skirt. Yes, sweetheart. Who's the master? <laughs> I love that movie, don't you? Who's the master? And right now, I can see a past president saying, you are something special. I can see a current president saying, that voice, that voice. I see two friends placing their hands on their hearts, welcoming me with open arms. I see a daughter 
singing the words of Jay-Z, go on and brush your shoulders off. I see a close friend saying, if you could only see in yourself, would we see in you? Now we're ready to answer that third grade little girl. Who's the master? Who's the master? I am. I am the master. The toast master. Next contestant, Beth Beasley. Purpose for pain. Purpose for pain. Beth Beasley. focused on a goal. 
Somebody told me that when you start looking at obstacles, that means you've taken your eyes off the prize. My prize was to lose weight. I stand before you today, 45 pounds lighter. I had to tell those Oreo cookies, no. Not only was that a physical struggle, but it was a mental struggle as well. Sometimes I had to tell that obstacle of my couch and on demand, no. You got to go to the gym. You got to go work it out. The more you burn, the better you'll feel. That pain was something that I had to face. And it was an obstacle that I refused to let stop me. The I. Insecurities. I'm sure every last one of you have heard a negative word about yourself. Someone has told you, you're not good enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not smart enough. You're not qualified enough. We've all heard those things. I refuse to let the sting and the pain of those words dictate my future. I didn't have that opportunity to go to college directly after high school, tending to a brother and sister. But I did pursue my degree and received a bachelor's degree in healthcare administration. Now pursuing a master's degree in the same field. Yes, there were insecurities. When I went to take the placement exam, I walked into that classroom and I thought I was gonna see nothing but teenagers. And here I stand, 40 years old, going back to school. Life will tell me, no, you've passed that test. You're done with that. But I refuse to let the pain of those words and those thoughts keep me from moving forward. The end, negativity. Sometimes we can be our own worst enemy. We can allow words that go into our head that we repeat over and over and over. He didn't choose me. I gave him all that I had and my first marriage didn't work out. I did the things that I was supposed to do. I prayed for him, I cooked for him, I submitted to him. What was wrong? Maybe I wasn't good enough. Negative thoughts. But I tried love again and now I'm married a second time to my husband and my pastor. <laughs> Negativity. Sometimes we can allow those words I've heard someone say that so is a man thinking, so is he. I heard a wise man tell me once, pain can be your motivator or your mortician. The choice is yours. So I ask you today, I challenge you today to believe that there's a purpose for your pain, but it's up to you to decide the perspective and where you go from here. Mr. Contest Chair. Thank you. Our next contestant, Stephen Fru. What God told Polly. What God told Polly. Stephen Fru.
contest master, fellow Toastmasters, and honored guests, how many of you have ever been asked tough questions by a little child? Please raise your hands. <laughs> Me too. November 7th, 1996, I was hanging some pictures in the hallway when Polly, our youngest child, age six, came out of her room with her friend, Sticky. Daddy, I have a question. Yes, Mom. Hi, Sticky. What's your question, huh? Daddy, Sticky would like you to please put the hammer down and listen to my question. <laughs> I'm sorry, honey. I'm listening. Daddy, how was God born? <laughs> Oh, well, um, Christmas Eve, you'll be playing an angel in the nativity. No, Daddy, that's Jesus. I'm wondering about God. I'm sorry, honey, I don't know. But Daddy, you're my Daddy, and Daddy's know everything. Please, please, please tell me I really want to know. I'm sorry, honey, but I, don't, I just don't know. Maybe you could try asking God. <laughs> okay, Daddy. <laughs> Half an hour later, Polly came back. Her eyes were bright, and she had a big smile on her face. Daddy, I prayed quiet, deep, and God told me how he was born. I'm listening. <laughs> They made little circles of sparkles. The little circles made a big circle of sparkles. The sparkles came together and made a rock. The rock followed its heart into a magic chamber. There was a chair. The rock sat down on the chair and turned into God. <laughs> but if you looked at the rock, you didn't see God. But on the other side of the rock, where you couldn't see, it was God. Wow. <laughs> Dad, how were the sparkles born? That's <laughs> <laughs> okay, Daddy, I'll ask God tonight. <laughs> the next evening. Hey Paul, wanna ride through the car wash with me? Yay! Daddy, God told me how the sparkles were born. <laughs> Let me pull over here. <laughs> God said that once upon a time there was a horn that didn't know how to beep. A long, long time went by, and then one day the horn went beep, and the sparkle flew out. <laughs> Daddy, how was the horn going? <laughs> That's okay, Daddy. I know what to do. <laughs> the next morning was Saturday. Hey, Paul, pancakes with Minnie Mouse ears. Coming, Daddy. Daddy, God told me about the horn. How was the horn born? God said the horn was never born. The horn was always there. I was so amazed, I asked Polly to dictate her story to me, and I wrote it down on some notes. I put the notes in the kitchen drawer. Fourteen years later, Polly was off at college, my wife Jackie and I were moving to smaller quarters and I was back in the hallway taking the pictures down. But Jackie called from the kitchen, Stephen, come see what I found. Yes, dear. It was the notes. Today, Polly's all grown up. She works in human resources for a logistics company. I gave Polly a copy of the notes, but she has completely forgotten her childhood conversations with God. Maybe when she's old, me, and the memories will come back. <coughs> Have you ever noticed something and then started to see it everywhere? I started seeing horns. <laughs> horns on trucks, horns in marching bands. Thanksgiving, the horn of plenty, or cornucopia. It was broken off of a divine goat by the infant Zeus, future king of the Greek gods, and it spills out unending food. The anniversary of God's creation of Adam and Eve, humanity, is celebrated 
by 100 blasts from the ram's horn or shofar at Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, also known as Feast of Trumpets. I'll skip the other name behind class. <laughs> Three years later, in May 2013, the mail came with my issue of Discover Magazine, which I opened to this page entitled Story of the Universe. This is modern science's view of the evolution of the universe, starting with the Big Bang. The long axis is time, the wide axis is space. The scientists have discovered a lot. What they call the Big Bang? Sparkles. Little circles of sparkles. Big circles of sparkles. Rocks. And a universe shaped like a horn. But the scientists have not discovered the magic chamber. Does that mean there is no magic chamber, no chair, no rock sitting on a chair, no God on the other side of the rock where you couldn't see, but who hears and answers a little girl's questions? Well, you decide. But I know what little Polly would say. Daddy, no, it wasn't a big bang. It was a big bee. We'll have one minute of silence. Our next contestant, Gloria Rostick. 30 seconds of candy, 30 seconds of candy. Lori Rostick. watching the planes take off. I was amazed at how quickly they changed. They'd be on the ground, and within about 30 seconds, soaring through the clouds off to their destination. In the distance, I could see another plane, grounded, broke. It wasn't going anywhere. Have you ever felt grounded, broke, waiting for your life to take off, waiting for something to change? Mr. Contest Chair, fellow passengers, fly back with me to the summer of 92. I had a dream of going to college, but the words of my mother had me broke, crushed. Words I heard my whole life. Lori, you're so stupid. Too stupid to do anything, too stupid to go anywhere. The sad part, I believe it. My dream faded away. But I landed what some might consider a dream job. My job was to meet and greet the rich and famous and guide them through the airport. Sound like a cool job? Not cool at all. These people had Louis Vuitton bags, bodyguards, and bad attitudes. Their egos were so big 
They should have been required to buy an extra seat. <laughs> and why did they have to be so mean? They would make me feel like I was above. They could crush. They were rich and had everything. I was broke and had nothing. I drooped up, faded away. But little did I know, in greeting this next guest, in about 30 seconds, he would change my life forever. Game face on, went over to the gate to greet him. Looked up, his flight was delayed. Typical for O'Hare. You know what ORD really means when you see it on your baggage plate? <laughs> Often, really, delayed. <laughs> so I waited, and I wondered, what would he be like? Because he was rich and famous and had big picture hits, like planes, trains, and automobiles, and Uncle Buck. But you want to know what I really wonder? Would he leave me a big tip? I waited. And finally, John Candy came off the plane. As he walked towards me, he was smiling from ear to ear. This warm, funny, infectious smile I knew so well from the big picture screen. His smile made me smile. Whoa, <laughs> this was a change. But that candy sweet smile and that bounce in the step, he came directly towards me, grabbed my hand, pulled it towards his, and began walking and swinging our hands together. <laughs> He said, thanks for meeting me today. What? <laughs> he appreciated that I was here to meet him? <laughs> this was a change. We continued swinging hands, and then he said, so where are we going? <laughs> I didn't even know what to say. Honestly, I was so amazed at his attitude and his gratitude and the way he was making me feel. He changed my altitude. I had gone from grounded to flight. We had only been together for 30 seconds, and I felt like a million bucks. A million uncle bucks. <laughs> I took the shortcut to the limo. He said, that was fast. You're a smart kid. I closed the limo door, and I watched him take off. I couldn't help but smile. Those unkind words with my mother, Faded away. That game face melted away. I had a new candy crush game face. <laughs> and who said candy isn't good for you? <laughs> he had just given me the best tip ever. Not the money kind. The life-changing kind. The change was kindness. Because when you feel like nothing, kindness can mean everything. Poet Maya Angelou said, some people may not remember what you said, some people may not remember what you did, but people will always remember the way you made them feel. I changed that day, and I realized I didn't need to be rich and famous to change my life or somebody else's life. It's the little acts of kindness that make a big difference. <coughs> and today, 23 years later, I'm married to a pilot <laughs> with a beautiful family, rich in love, famous in my children's eyes. And I earned that college degree. And now I'm working on my master's. In Toastmasters. <laughs> and what if you shared a little more candy? At home? At work? What if you smiled a little more? Said thanks a little more? Took a little more time? Perhaps just 30 seconds? To make somebody feel like a million bucks? Whoa! What a difference. You make. See, I used to look out that picture window. Now, I see the big picture. Grounded. No more. Changed because of 30 seconds of candy.
soaring through the clouds with no limits to my destination, forever changed. It only took about 30 seconds, but it was sweet. <coughs> Candy sweet. Sir Contest. Next contestant, John Benishek, failure, failure, John Benishek. Oh 
actually completed three whole sentences. <laughs> Do you know what this is? <coughs> this is the work of a loser. This is the work of someone who will be a failure for the rest of his life.
Thank you. Our next contestant, Eric Biden Dagan. A gift from Grammy. A gift from Grammy. Eric Finan David. Without exception, we all have had one special birthday. For some, it's sweet 16. For others, it's a day that we can drink legally. And yet for others, it's any birthday that ends in a zero. Meaning we survived another decade. But how many of us can remember a birthday that ends in two zeros? For my wife's grandmother, better known as Granny, she can. For last spring, she turned 100. Master Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and guests. Allow me to repeat myself. She turned 100! Yeah! It's triple digits. It's 25 leap years. It's like reaching 100,000 miles on the odometer of life. Heck, she's even 10 years older than Toastmasters. Now, does she look 100? In a word, yes. <laughs> but remember, she's been through the Great Depression, two world wars, and now the Kardashians. <laughs> but if you met Granny, she's sweet, petite, and her smile lights up a room. And anyone in. As we were celebrating her miles from birthday at the nursing home, I asked her, Granny, what's the meaning of life? She looked at me and said, What? <laughs> You're mean to your wife? <laughs> now, Granny had lost her home, she lost her husband, but she kept her sense of humor. She then grabbed a paper and a pen, and she wrote down one word, a century of experience, and all she can give me is one word? As I reflected on it, I looked out at Grammy's friends, and it struck me, even though their bodies were dying, their souls were thriving. The word became much more profound. And that word was today. You see, these people live for the moment. They're scraping every last bit of peanut butter out of that jar of life. And then licking the spoon. Their future is today. It takes me back five years ago, when a good friend of mine, Mike, took a job and moved to Arizona. Now Mike and I, we were buds. We were like this. Here's the kind of guy that Mike was. When the car broke down at three in the morning, who did I call? Mike. When I got married, who planned my bachelor party? Mike. When I started a business and needed a partner that I could trust, who did I ask? Mike. And all right, I'll admit it, when I almost fainted giving my icebreaker speech, who was there to catch me? Who was there to catch me? Mike. From the moment he moved out there, we started to plan a reunion. But our reunion went from a definite day to some day to one day. Last summer, I got a call from Mike's mom. He was going to be back in his hometown in Tennessee. I jumped on an airplane, rented a car, and drove out to his hometown to deliver Mike's eulogy. You see, 
sim. Magitai. To the diabetes. He was 33. You know, some say that the greatest nation in the world is imagination. I gotta tell you, as I looked at Mike's casket, it was clear to me that the worst nation in the world is procrastination. I always knew I'd see Mike again one day. I just never dreamed it was going to be that day. Our future is today. Sometimes we can look at life as a can. A can that we just keep kicking down the road. Someday, I'm going to write that book. Someday, I'm going to give that next speech. Someday, Steve, I just might answer how God was born. <laughs> someday, someday, someday. Our future is today. This past Valentine's, my family and I, we went back to the nursing home to visit Grant. And she was celebrating like it was 1969. <laughs> Grammy had taken first place. It was named Queen of the St. Valentine's Day Ball. As I handed her my one-year-old, I gave her a big, great, great, great hug. And their smiling faces took me back to Grammy's birthday and the gift that she gave me. Whether you're one, or 100, or somewhere in between, don't wait until it's too late to live, to learn, and to love. Our future is today. Contestant, please remain silent so the judges can finish their ballot forms. We will try to maintain silence until all judges have finished the forms. Get up and take a stretch. <laughs> All the contestants to come here on stage. Give them a big round of applause. same question. What club are you representing? What area? What division? 771-880. Way up. <laughs> Valerie, this speech. The inspiration for why this speech now? Well, that first thing, that third grade little girl was me. 
So for years I've been trying to speak in front of a crowd. I can speak to children, no problem. But speaking to adults is really, really difficult. And one night I was lying in my bed and my creator just told me it's time to let this go and wrote out that speech for me. Just made it very easy. It was time. Valerie, you are the master man. Wow. Thank you. And our next contestant, Steve Serby. <coughs> Steve, what club, what area, what division? Club number 1983-948, BP GBS America Speaks Out, Area 73, West Division. Yeah. Wow. Same question, why this speech now? I've been involved in Special Olympics, as I mentioned. I've got a lot of personal reasons for that, and a lot of friends and family who have children in Special Olympics. I've been involved in them for about the past six, seven years, and they're really an inspiring group. Steve, thank you. And our next contestant was Gina Coates. You know the drill by now? I'm representing GE Healthcare Toastmasters, club number 1241196, area 2, Northwest Division. Yeah. So again, the inspiration for this speech and why you give this speech now? Well, two things happened in a short span of time from each other. One was that I had a team leader at work that came back to our team and he, he realized that he wasn't really serving our team very well and he said, you guys deserve better. And I thought, whoa, that really resonated with me. He's admitting his fault. And he actually said, you guys deserve better. And then about two weeks after that, my neighbor posted an article on Facebook and it was about how your husband is not your uh, mechanic and your uh, valet and all these other things. And your husband is the person you marry for love. And those two ideas just became inextricably put together and mashed together. And this speech was born. And I was not even planning on competing this season. So I, I'm so thankful for the opportunity. Our next contestant is you. Yvette Beasley, Club Area Division. Okay. My club is Toastmasters, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Club Number 0268 Area, I don't remember. <laughs> I don't know my area, but Central North Division. And the purpose, uh, the reason why this speech and now, we all deal with pain in some sort of fashion, whether it's physical or mental. And I'm just determined to believe what the Bible says, that all things work together for good. And I believe that there's a purpose for pain if we look at it in the perspective that we choose. Our next contestant is Stephen Fruit. Successfully speaking, I'm sorry, the of the area. <laughs> District 30. Is <laughs> 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 anybody out here can help stand up? No. <laughs> Your speech. The inspiration for it and why give this speech now. The speech has been growing inside of my heart since the original events, which I remember very clearly, although Polly does not. <laughs> I joined Toastmasters three years ago, and it gave me the skills to express what was growing in my heart, and today was the time. Thank you.
next contestant was Lori Rasnick. Rasnick. I'm struggling with her last name. I didn't use your maiden name. No. Her maiden name is real easy. Okay, Lori, club area division. Club is 4871, Orland Park. Area 36, division is Southwest. Right. Question is, why this speech now? <laughs> This speech now because we all have a story and John Candy was a story in my life and what he taught me was truly kindness and through a smile and having gratitude and you know being concerned about how people feel that's how I try to live my life every day and I think the world would be a better place if we were all aware of those things every day and what really inspired me was I was actually going to use another speech for this contest and something happened in my life and I had to back out of the contest and then Garrett Gray, my amazing mentor, texted me and said, do your candy speech. And I went, oh, yeah, I could do that. And so you inspired me to do that. And here I am today. So thank you, bud. Thanks. And our next contestant is John Benishek. Club Area Division, John. Okay. I'm from. Oh, it's pretty hot. <laughs> yeah, baby. <laughs> Don't get me started. I'm from Park Ridge Toastmasters Club Number Three Eighty One, celebrating sixty-five years of being in existence. Yeah. We're gonna keep on going until we get it right. Yeah. <laughs> We're in Area. And we're in the Northeast Division. <laughs> and my inspiration for my speech, it started out as I was working on one of the advanced club manuals for poetry. So I did Casey at the Bat. And it went over really well. I thought, I think I'm going to put a poem in my next speech. So I was talking with my son who was unsure whether he should go out with this woman because he's, he said, well, she's really nice and I'm afraid that I would fall in love with her and then she would dump me and I would be in pain and it would be depressing so maybe I shouldn't even go out with her. <laughs> <laughs> you just wasted on all the wrong people! So I said, you can't be afraid of failure. And then I wrote the poem and wrote the speech and I can't leave out Mrs. Robinson who made the perfect villain for that speech as well. <laughs> Our next contestant, Eric Fine and Day. Eric, club, area, division. I never thought he'd ask. <laughs> Lake County Toastmasters, club number 652972. Lake County, and also I just want to give a quick shout out to the Who's Talking, by their club in Gurney. Uh, so, um, Lake County Toastmasters is area 45, and I'm from the North Division. Woo! Yeah! That's right. So, you know, the inspiration, obviously I lost a very close friend of mine, and, you know, you contrast that with Grammy, who will be 101 uh, very soon here. And, you know, life teaches you lessons and allows you to reflect on some things. And losing Mike at such a young age, it, it, it taught me a lesson that, yes, we do need to live for today and for the moment and, that, and to cherish those special moments that we have in life. A lot of work for putting one of these contests together. I mean, a lot of work. Make sure everything comes off like it's supposed to. I had the easy job up there, very easy job. This is made easy by Frank, your contest chair. He's the one that deserves all the applause here.
Thank you. Very, very kind. Well, this may have been a lot of work. It was a labor of love. It was truly a magnificent contest. I do not envy the judges. What a difficult choice they have to make. Eight outstanding speeches. Once again, please, a fine round of applause for our contestants. That's right, go ahead, stand up, take them out. Dee Marie says it best. Yes! Where was that voice when he first asked you to stand up and speak about the timers? 